Welcome to this edition of Italics, the Italian American magazine. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburi. First, I hope all of our viewers and their families had a happy Thanksgiving. As an early gift to our community, we at Italics would like to take you to the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., for the National Italian American Foundation's 32nd Annual Weekend Conference and Gala Awards Dinner. Held at the Hilton Hotel the first weekend after Columbus Day, the working meetings, conferences, and other events all culminate on Saturday evening in the massive ballroom with a star-studded gala awards dinner. Legendary film director Martin Scorsese, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, and the Honorable Rudolph Giuliani, former mayor of New York City, were among the evening's honorees. The many other luminaries in attendance included Supreme Court Justices Samuel Alito and Antonin Scalia, CNBC anchorwoman Maria Bartiromo, and legendary Yankee and Baseball Hall of Famer Yogi Berra. Now, let's go to Washington, D.C. and join Master of Ceremonies Maria Bartiromo for the National Italian American Foundation's Gala Awards Dinner. Good evening, everyone, and buona sera. It is wonderful to be with you tonight, and it is my honor to share the dais with such wonderful and talented Italians and Italian-American luminaries. Luciano Pavarotti was a great friend of the National Italian-American Foundation. He attended a number of events and personally presented the Niaf Pavarotti Scholarship to deserving young people. His passing just five weeks ago was a tremendous loss for Niaf, the nation, and the world. We have lost a great love. Luciano Pavarotti, a man from Modena, Italy, became a man of the whole world, an icon of the world. The little tenor was born in Modena, Italy on October 12, 1935. As a teenager, he joined his father in the city's chorus while training to become a teacher. Fortunately for the world, he abandoned that career path after his opera debut as Rodolfo in La Boheme. This spectacular superstar recently celebrated his 40th year as an opera singer. Pavarotti the tenor is the most successful classical recording artist in history, with record sales in the hundreds of millions. For the past 10 years, Pavarotti has staged a very special project to benefit the less fortunate in the world. The world is the symbol of hate. To teach them love, they should not have war. That is my dream. The NIEF has so many wonderful programs for young people, scholarships, mentoring, internships, language camps, and a lot more. Tonight, we would like to focus on a program that has helped a new generation discover their heritage. Since 2001, the National Italian American Foundation, through the generosity of its members, has sponsored an opportunity for college-age students of Italian American descent to immerse themselves in Italian culture, commerce, and society. Each year, university students from all over the United States apply to the program with an essay and professional recommendation. The finalists are awarded a 10-day guided study trip to one region in Italy, places bypassed by the typical tourists, such as Abruzzo, La Marche, and Lombardy. For several years, NIAF's discovery program has flourished thanks to the extraordinary efforts of one man. This leader has generously shared his financial support. The Ambassador Peter F. Secchia Voyage of Discovery program will continue to strengthen the Italian-American identity. My first opportunity to visit the beautiful Republic of Italy was as an 18-year-old U.S. Marine who had just flunked out of Michigan State University. During that Mediterranean cruise with the U.S. Sixth Fleet, over 50 years ago, an instant love affair was born. My excitement made my Italian grandparents terribly proud. Lee and I are each announcing tonight that we're pledging $1 million 
in an irrevocable bequest, bequest for the endowment of the voyage of discovery. Our $2 million is a challenge grant to all of you on a two-to-one basis. If your combined pledges exceed $1 million, NEAF will have their $3 million dream endowment and the Voyage of Discovery program is endowed in perpetuity for your grandchildren and your grandchildren's grandchildren. And we now have a very special tribute to a man who was part of the National Italian American Foundation for three decades. This past April, we lost one of our NIAV founding members, Jack Valenti. Jack Valenti's brilliant life story could inspire several films. On September 5, 1921, he was born into a second-generation Italian-American family in a working-class neighborhood of Houston, Texas. Jack helped out in his grandfather's grocery store, sold newspapers on the street corners, and showed people to their seats in a Houston movie house called the Iris Theater. Later, during World War II, Jack became a B-25 pilot in the U.S. Army Air Corps. He flew 51 combat missions over Italy and received America's most prestigious decorations, including the Distinguished Flying Cross. After the war, Jack attended Harvard Business School on the GI Bill. Years later, he met the man who ultimately would have a great impact on his career, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And when Johnson became John F. Kennedy's running mate, he asked Jack to run the ticket's ad campaign in Texas. A couple of years later, he married Johnson's secretary, Mary Margaret Wiley. In 1966, Jack resigned his White House post to become only the third president and CEO of the Motion Picture Association of America. With a showman's flair and a preacher's power of persuasion, Jack became a power broker connecting Hollywood and Capitol Hill. Tonight, the National Italian American Foundation is honoring Jack by launching a new program in his memory. NIAF's Jack Valenti Memorial Institute will award fellowships to Italian Americans in Hollywood and in Washington, D.C. NIAF has asked Academy Award winning director Martin Scorsese to inaugurate the Institute this evening. My great pleasure to present the Jack Valenti Award to Martin Scorsese. Marty, Jack loved the gritty realism of your films. He so admired you. He considered you a, a great Italian-American, a good friend, and this is for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Very pleased and honored to be here tonight to be the first recipient of the Jack Valenti Award. And I, I did have the honor of knowing Jack. He was an extraordinary man, fair and honorable, a gentleman in every sense of the word. I got to know Jack more in the mid-70s when I was making my first movies, and I, I made all my pictures under the rating system that Jack developed. So I really didn't have any first-hand experience of the chaos within the industry before he started. Um, in that uh, when he, before he entered the scene, you had the Hayes Code, you had decrees about what you could and what you couldn't see. But Jack turned that all around. He developed a system that helped audiences decide what films were appropriate for themselves and for their children. And at the same time, allowing filmmakers as much as possible to continue to work without inhibiting their creative, creative expression. He knew a lot of the world has learned about this country by watching our movies. So in essence, Jack made American movie making safe for filmmakers to be adventurous. With the ratings board, I've had uh, an intimate relationship with it since 1973, with the picture I made called Mean Streets, the first one. Um, well, thank you. Me mean Streets was a, uh, it was a picture I was burning to make, it was autobiographical, and deep down, quite honestly, I, I got the money for it, I ran with it, you know, to make the picture, and uh, before they caught on. And, uh, <laughs> Deep down, I honestly didn't think the picture would even be released. I, I, I was just satisfied to just get it up on a shelf somewhere. Maybe someday somebody will see it. The language was pretty bad. Language was street language. It was the Vulgate. Uh, it may have been, I think, the first film 
uh, to have contained such language up to that time. The picture gets shown at the New York Film Festival, 1973. That night, my, it's very nerve-wracking. My parents are with me, and people come up to my mother. Mrs. Gossesi, what did you think of the film? What did you think of your son's film? She goes, I just want you to know, we never use that word in the house. <laughs> and she was right. My father was from Polizzi Generosa. Polizzi was in, uh, outside of Palermo, and they all congregated, they all wound up in a building 241 Elizabeth. The, the building, 232, became Chimina. Uh, 241 became Polizzi. So when my father wanted to marry my mother in 1933, my mother said, it's a problem, it's a different nationality. <laughs> and there were some sit-downs, a lot of sit-downs. And it worked out. But some of that old neighborhood is still alive in me and in my memories, and some of those memories became a part of Mean Streets. And um, that film for the rating system got an R rating, and it deserved it. You know, it's Jack's system, and I will say now that all my movies um, have been made through the rating system, and I wouldn't go back and change anything in them, any of the films. I was never... I was never told to stay away from a certain subject matter or had one of my pictures suppressed, because that would be censorship. But what Jack did was something very different. He understood that with artistic freedom does come responsibility. That's the balance he was trying to preserve with the system. It's self-regulation, as Jack pointed out, and we have to do it ourselves. If we don't, somebody else is going to do it for us or impose it on us. I truly admire the way Jack said, free speech is the most precious value we have in this country, and people must stand up for it and have courage enough to fight for it. There's an old saying, and he quoted, Dear God, let me join those who seek the truth and deliver me from the company of those who have found it, unquote. <laughs> That's what he said. It's, it's an amazing quote. Um, and this knowledge, understanding, and tolerance through dialogue, this is Jack's legacy. And I'll be forever thankful for it, and I miss him. And I thank you so much for this. Thank you. Thank you. NIAV board member Bill Novelli is a recognized leader in the international practice of social marketing. As CEO of the 39 million member AARP, Bill is dedicated to building a society in which everyone ages with dignity and purpose. This role is only the most recent in a lifetime of promoting ideas and issues that focus on improving the human condition. Providing relief to many of the world's most disadvantaged people as Executive Vice President of CARE. Taking on Big Tobacco as President of the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. And as Director of Advertising and Creative Services for the Peace Corps. In 1972, Bill and Jack Porter co-founded Porter Novelli for the marketing of social and health issues. The agency became one of the world's largest with corporate, nonprofit, and government clients. I am about as Italian as an American can get. All four of my grandparents came to this country from Italy, and all of them had the same goal, for their children and their grandchildren to become Americans. In my life at AARP, I see how connected America's generations are. Grandparents care about their children, their grandchildren, and leaving this country a better place. While four of my grandparents came to this country from Italy, they and my parents all believed in the American dream. Uh, and with the benefits of that dream come the responsibility of good citizenship, of contributing to society, to make things fair, and to make life better for everyone. And I think that's what we all want to do, each in our own way. It's what I've tried to do through public advocacy. It's what guided me when we started Porta Novelli to apply marketing to social issues and causes. It's what led me to a second career in public service at CARE, at the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, and now at AARP where we advocate for a better life across all generations. Concetta Rosalie Anna Ingolia was born in Brooklyn, New York, the daughter of singer Eleanor McGinley and musician Peter Ingolia. After her parents divorced, Concetta lived with her Italian grandparents, speaking Italian at home. 
Coming from a musical family, it wasn't long before a teenage Conchetta formed her first singing group, then moved to Los Angeles. Soon, America began its love affair with the beautiful, vivacious, and gutsy young woman who changed her name to Connie Stevens. Today, Nayef wants to honor Connie Stevens for her extraordinary dedication to the men and women of the U.S. military. The lovely Connie Stevens right here. I want to thank you. I want to thank you. I'm, I'm in awe of all the people that I love so dearly and hang out with. And my very own idol, Yogi Berra, that I sat on the back of the car, took my life in my hands from Brooklyn being a Yankee fan, I want you to know. All for him. And nothing has made me more proud in a lifetime than my Italian heritage. My children who support me no matter what I do, they happen to be here. Young actresses, very successful people in their own right. Jolie and Trisha Lee Fisher. Stand up, girls, show them how a good I did. Generations ago, in the great migration wave of the early 20th century, two families came to America. One from the hillside town of Montecatini, the other from Naples. Their children married. And in 1944, Helen and Harold Giuliani had one child, Rudolph William Louis Giuliani. In the rough and tumble East Flatbush neighborhood, Rudy's dad taught him the old world values of hard work, discipline, and a sense of duty. Harold made sure his son developed a character marked by courage and honesty. He also taught Rudy to be tough, Harold knew the world could be unjust and cruel. Though Rudy's father believed those childhood lessons would serve his son well, he could not have foreseen how they would one day help our nation during some of its darkest days. On the morning of September 11, 2001, New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani was attending a breakfast meeting when an aide told him the World Trade Center had been hit by commercial aircraft. The mayor raced downtown while the evacuation of the skyscrapers was underway. Throughout that day, and in the months to follow, the eyes of the world looked to Rudy Giuliani, America's mayor, for leadership in a time of inconceivable loss. This massive attack was intended to break our spirit. Has not done that. It's made us stronger, more determined, and more resolved. You realize that the strength that you have largely come from what your mother and father taught you. My father used to tell me all the time, whenever you're in a crisis and people around you are getting very upset, the main thing to do is to become calmer and calmer and calmer. And I've always done that. I think this crisis that we've had to get through together has reminded us of our commonality as human beings. Thank you very much, Louis Free. I'm very honored to receive the award from Louis but I feel compelled to tell you uh, the truth about it. <laughs> Louie and I work very closely together in the United States Attorney's Office. First year that I was the United States Attorney, based on a case that he was investigating, ultimately known as the Pizza Connection case, there was this um, group in Italy 
that put out a contract to kill me and Louis and others, and the, the, the amount that they offered to kill me was $800,000. The FBI caught them. It all got resolved. I calmed down. <laughs> I was U.S. attorney for five and a half years. We prosecuted many, many cases. I thought they had great value to the public and organized crime cases, political corruption cases, white-collar crime cases, all kinds of cases. Right near the end of the time I was the United States Attorney, another organized crime figure that got angry, took it personally that we put him in jail for 100 years, <laughs> put out a contract on me to kill me again, this time for $400,000. <laughs> I was going in the wrong direction. <laughs> Come on, at least double the value after all that work. <laughs> my father came from Manhattan, my mother from Brooklyn. My mother required my father to live in Brooklyn with her family. My father's family was from northern Italy. My mother's family was from southern Italy. My father never liked living in Brooklyn. His revenge, his revenge was to make me a Yankee fan. It was. He, he brought me home from the hospital in a pinstriped garment. I know I'm a Yankee fan because of my Italian-American heritage, because before, before I even could think, he was whispering things like, Joe DiMaggio. Tony Lazzari, Phil Rizzuto, Yogi Berra. The wonderful thing about America is, America doesn't require you to give up your heritage. America encourages, America, America encourages you to take your heritage with you here and meld it into everything else that we have. And I think, I really believe that this putting together of Italian and American is even greater than the sum of the parts. And this organization demonstrates it. And thank you very much for making me a part of it. And God bless you. 1940, the family who lived in this house at 245 Albemarle Street in Baltimore's Little Italy welcomed its seventh child and only daughter, Nancy Patricia D'Alessandro. Her parents, Annunziata and Thomas D'Alessandro, were at the center of a community that was as tight-knit as a village from the old country, albeit a multi-ethnic one, inhabited not only by Italians, but also first and second and third generations of German, Jewish, African-American, and Irish immigrants. Nancy's father, Thomas D'Alessandro, took office as a U.S. congressman a few months before Nancy was born. Seven years later, Nancy stood next to him as he was sworn in as mayor of Baltimore. Nancy helped stuff envelopes. She listened and she learned. After graduating from Baltimore's All Girls Institute of Notre Dame High School, Nancy attended Trinity College in Washington, D.C. There she met Paul Pelosi, whom she married after graduating in 1963. They moved first to New York, where they started their family then to Paul's hometown, San Francisco. Nancy and Paul had five children in six years. While Paul built his business, Nancy committed herself to home and family life, as her mother had done. Nancy waited until her youngest child was a senior in high school to run for political office. In 1987, Nancy moved into a spectacular new house, the United States House of Representatives. Within 15 years, she was elected Democratic leader. Then in 2007, the woman whom one political observer called a glamorous granny became the first woman, the first Californian, and the first Italian-American to hold the position of Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. She is the first woman to lead a major party in the Congress. She has broken the marble ceiling to become the Speaker of the House, and she makes us all so proud to be Italian-Americans. The Speaker, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Governor Napolitano. 
I'm also very proud to receive this award in the presence of my family, both my family from Baltimore, Maryland, and I'm so pleased that my brother, the former mayor of Baltimore, Thomas D'Alessandro, and his wife Margie are here. My father's grandparents were from Genoa and Venice, and his father was from Abruzzi. My mother's family was from Sicily and from Calabria. My husband's parents, want, his mother was born in Lucca, and his father was born in Potenza. So our children are 100% Italian. <laughs> but in any event, the point is that in our family, we were raised, as in most of those families, and all of them, I'm sure, gathered here to be deeply, devoutly Catholic, as the case was in our family, devoutly Catholic, deeply proud of our Italian heritage, and at the same time, fiercely patriotic with the love that we have of our country. Every generation of Americans has the goal of making the future better for the next generation. So I know when I went into that speaker's office, I did so not only standing on the shoulders of America's women, but standing lifted up by the contributions of all those who came from Italy long before or shortly before, again with a commitment to make America a better place, with a commitment to make the future better for their families. As a teenager, Ellen was so slender her girlfriends called her Straticella, or Rags. But this Straticella was determined to get out of Everett and write her own Cinderella story. In 2002, the Hollywood newcomer auditioned for a feature film called Moonlight Mile. Ellen's performance in Midnight Mile got rave reviews. Soon she was playing against some of Hollywood's hottest stars. Hello, Deadhead. Hello. Enjoying your free ride? Today, just about everyone knows the name Ellen Pompeo. When I sat down tonight and I looked around and I saw the company I was in, I thought, what am I doing here? <laughs> I'm here because people like all of you have inspired me. It's because of people like you I was able to dream and accomplish my dreams. On behalf of all of us, this is to everyone who sacrificed and suffered and left their country so that we could realize our dreams. This is serious. I'm accusing the New York Times, the Washington Post, and all of the rest of the elite media of not reporting this event the way it should. Tomorrow or Monday, you will see in the style section or the society pages, oh, it was a great party. The pasta was al dente for 3,000 people. Ellen Pompeo was beautiful. Gina Lowe Bridget looked wonderful. It's all true. But what they missed was the excellence. If what was stand, if the people who were standing before had any other ethnic surnames or different skin color, there'd be two, a two-inch headline in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and I want them to report it. Well, that's it for this episode. On December 5th at 7 a.m., 1 p.m., and 11 p.m. on CUNY TV Channel 75, Italics will present a 60-minute special dedicated entirely to the many events that occurred during the 2007 Italian Heritage and Culture Month. As we roll our credits this month, you'll enjoy a musical performance by the legendary songwriter and singer Neil Sadaka, who performed at the NIAF Gala. Mr. Sadaka is celebrating 50 years of music and recently held a concert at New York City's Carnegie Hall celebrating that fact. Thanks for watching, Italics. Please join us again. I'm Anthony Tamburi. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata. See you next time. See you next time.